Well, thank you, Brent, for that that introduction. And um, I don't want my house to feel bad for calling it a shack, but I think the oak is the most valuable thing on the property, to be quite honest. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, wonderful to see so many people here and uh, uh, folks I've, I both recognize and names that I think I know who they are if there were last names attached. So uh, thanks thanks for coming out and uh, being interested in, in this talk on historical uh, ecology. Um, and so it's gonna play on work that's a lot of it from the most recent project called the Los Angeles Landscape History Project, um, which has a whole bunch of collaborators, but also previous historical ecology projects going all the way back to uh, work that I did in grad school uh, with the late Rudy Matoni, who we were just uh, mentioning earlier. And um, this is, so I'll just quickly show you, this is a list of institutions that were working together on this landscape history project. Um, organizations with representation uh, includes uh, the three major tribal groups in the in the region, uh, several universities, uh, and uh, folks even further afield than, than local. And so uh, as I go along, there'll be some subheads that'll mention some names of particular folks who contributed in certain areas. Uh, but I just wanted to get out there the appreciation for this large uh, consortium that's currently working on it. Um, I added a few extra names in here from previous historical ecology projects, San Francisco Estuary Institute, Southern California uh, Coastal Water Research Project, um, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, this, this, uh, this place uh, that we call uh, Los Angeles has has changed quite a bit uh, over the years, uh, going from rivers that might look like uh, that on the left to that on the upper right. Um, the Coanga Pass is sort of unrecognizable to us on the lower uh, on the lower right. And uh, you know, I've been interested in uh, for ever since I got handed a sheaf of papers um, that uh, Rudy sent me gave me in grad school. Uh, he said. Uh, I think there's a paper in here, was it, I think were his exact words. And he had done a little work on an area that we're gonna talk about in a, in a while. And he kind of just set me off um, with basically arms with a, a pat on the head and the knowledge that he'd done the, the, the first draft uh, sort of um, to go off and investigate the uh, plants, uh, the historical plants uh, of a particular region and just sent me off to the Arab area. And uh, so I spent a lot of, uh, this was one of those classic grad school projects we called pot boilers. Uh, we just sort of keep them on the back burner and simmer them along and eventually you get done. And so I just spent extra time when I could in herbaria looking through old herbarium records before they were all digitized and looking at those labels and uh, figuring out what the places were. And I'd only been in LA for a few years. So I was learning both the contemporary place names and then from those labels and old atlases and uh, whatnot, I was learning old place names uh, at the same time. And the purpose behind all this was really to come up with sort of a what was LA like before we turned it into the metropolitan region that we know today. And I'm showing you right now um, the classic Kukler uh, potential natural vegetation map of California, which was published with Vegetation of California, I think it was called. I'm trying to remember the Barber book, and it was this was an insert to it, and uh, and this was what what Kukler did um, for what they call potential natural vegetation, which is kind of like what the vegetation would be if humans didn't mess with it. Um, so it's not like it ever was this, because um, as our LA Landscape History Project is predicated on. There have been people managing the vegetation in the LA basin in Southern California for something like 9,000 years, so or 10,000 or something along those lines. And when you get back before that, you've got you know some large mammals that impact the, the landscape considerably, and you got a different climate before that. So this isn't like a historical map, but it's like if humans hadn't paved it all 
uh, and it were sort of quote unquote in uh, in uh, harmony with its uh, climate, uh, this is what it might look like. And we thought this was a you know an okay place to start, but not nearly good enough. Uh, we've got oak forest is a major thing there. We had this southern seashore that was described as a dune area. That's the thing Rudy sent me to work on first, that purple thing that's number 61 on the map there. Uh, we got chaparral, we got sagebrush, um, and we've got a bunch of lines for water, but it's, it's a little bit not completely satisfying uh, if you're gonna go out and try to restore. Um, and so we moved on to try to rebuild and understand some of the unique things uh, of these habitats. And so it meant identifying places that maybe today are thought of as salt water that were actually fresh water. And that's that left on the right, that's Winimi, which was spread, uh, fed by springs and not by, and not by uh, seawater. Or it means looking at the, the flora and fauna to understand their habitat uh, requirements and look at the old bird records and figure out what the plants might have been. Or the upper right, that's a uh, special sea slug basically that changes its larval form based on whether a coastal estuary is open to the ocean or closed to the ocean. And uh, so it's spe it's adapted specifically to closing and opening estuaries. So its presence is evidence of that in the historical records. So there's all these kind of things we can do to try to understand and fill in some nuance in that map. Um, and so these are just some examples. I steal these from our colleagues at uh, San Francisco Estuary Institute, uh, but we've got aerial photographs, uh, oblique ones, we've got old drawings, we have textual accounts, we have um, the surveys that were done to uh, do meets and bounds the, to sort for property. Uh, we have maps of all sorts, the coastal surveys uh, in, the, in the, late, uh, the mid to late 1800s. Um, and then also just photographs, which uh, when you find them sometimes can provide that bit of evidence about a place at a particular time that you, uh, you know, were interested in. And I always want to emphasize this is that doing historical ecology is using the past to understand the present and maybe envision future potential but it's not about recreating the past. And I always have to say this because when I give this presentation to some audiences, they're like, well, I can't put that back there or that, you know, that makes no sense. It's like, no, 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 this isn't about this. It's about understanding the landscape and its potential so that we don't do stuff that's totally stupid um, and, um, you know, understand how it works. So it's about how it works and not necessarily the way it was. Um, and that's a really important distinction is that we're using this to understand process and then where to look on the landscape for certain things. Um, I, this is just an example from an Orange County project I was working on where you've got this stock pond that has a little um, dam in it. There's clearly a dam and this is maybe a 1950s topo. Uh, but you go back to the 30s uh, aerial photograph and you see that there's actually a wet area there. So that was probably like a vernal marsh or a wet meadow. Uh, that got turned into a perennial uh, pond uh, by the modification of the landscape. And so to go to the sort of the end at the beginning, um, this is kind of how far we've gotten with the historical habitats at a one kilometer scale. We figured we'd start with a kilometer uh, because, you know, how hard can that be? What was the dominant vegetation in a, in a, in a square kilometer across the entire LA basin? And of course, now we've extended it out to uh, Ventura County and up into the mountains. Um, and we'll get into some of these habitats as we go along, uh, but it's kind of like our Minecraft version of the historical ecology uh, as, a, as a starting point for understanding it. And then we go in and zoom in in particular places and can understand them better. Uh, some of the important things that we find, uh, brackish wetlands and then their associated plants in Biona. Biona, as we'll talk about, was not a uh, perennially open uh, harbor. To the contrary, it was closed most of the time. We have the forb fields and vernal pools of the South Bay. Uh, we have the alka extensive alkali meadows, uh, which are the sort of the landward side of our uh, coastal wetlands. Uh, there's also alkali meadows that, that, that go up along uh, through here. The riparian forest coming through the um, 
the LA River and also where the LA River combines with the San Gabriel River. Uh, so every one of these things has a code. Uh, each color has a code. And this is our, our current working hypothesis of the dominant vegetation of each square mile of the uh, however far we've gotten up into the watersheds there. Um, so to talk about some of these places, that first one. So this is where I got dumped in the deep end uh, before we had digitized herbarium specimens, uh, before you could do all this research on the computer, Rudy hands me basically this map and says, this is this thing I think was not actually a coastal dune environment, but in fact was a grassland, a forb field in grassland. Uh, that he, he thought we should call the coast Los Angeles coastal prairie. And it was, it was spotted with vernal pools and vernal marshes, uh, which are all these dark green things that go. We've got the Biona Gap up here at the top, Palos Verdes Hills here at the bottom. LAX for reference is right about there. And these are all vernal pools and with all the great plants that went along with vernal pools that at the time, if you look this up in 1995 or when or four, whenever I started on this, um, no one was talking about the fact that there were vernal pools in coastal Los Angeles. Uh, but off we go to the herbarium, off we go to look at various things, and what do we find? We find rare plants in the herbarium specimens that are um, representative of those vernal pools that we had. Uh, Orchidea californica, classic vernal pool indicator. You know, what's it say on the herbarium specimen? Dry ditches assimilating vernal pools around the airport, or at the old municipal airport at Rosecrans of the Lewin Henson. Um, so it's like, this is a vernal pool indicator species and it wouldn't be there in the ditches if it hadn't been there in the vernal pools around it. Um, the lemongrass here, abundant in a meadow near a corner, in exiccated places, which are those, this was the language used to describe a place that was wet then dried out. Um, so sort of describing vernal pools without saying vernal pools. This from the Roy Abrams and, you know, you get yourself a whole copy of Leroy Abrams, you know, early flora of Los Angeles, you can learn quite a bit about where things used to be. Um, and so that turns into, this is now the one kilometer version of our coastal grasslands and, fl and flower fields uh, ranging from Bayona Creek. And now we have the finer scale line work, but this is just that, that Minecraft version that we're working with at the moment. And out there, we also had this wonderful thing. This was a, um, a photograph that was in the Natural History Museum from some excursions that were taken out to explore the biodiversity of the El Segundo dunes, which of course are the extreme active dunes or the extreme coastal portion of this region. And uh, they took some photographs. And so Rudy in his, um, his mad scientist glory uh, took a, uh, uh, dissecting microscope and put this photograph under it and ran a series of transects across the photograph and identified the species, the cover in this photograph. And so this actually ends up in the paper, um, the different species that are identifiable under a microscope from this basically 1920s uh, photograph uh, that we had. And this is the prairie uh, going up to the dune. So this is the back dune uh, that basically behind you turns into LAX. The dunes are still there. Pershing uh, Drive will go right across uh, where those telegraph poles are. And that, that era, that probably is telegraph poles. Um, so you, you switch from the active dune vegetation to this grassland and prairie, which was really a, a remarkable forb field, vibrant spring bloom, super bloom. You know, you wouldn't have had to go to Lancaster to get your fill of poppies. Uh, in the spring in 1930s Los Angeles and, I, and lupins as well. And I know this as well because we take information where we can get it on these projects. And uh, I knew that my third grade teacher here in Orono, Maine, where I'm sitting right now, had grown up in Inglewood, California. And so I was doing this paper and she was elderly at that time. I wrote back and I said, Mrs. Lines, do you remember anything about the, the area between Inglewood and the dunes. And she wrote this wonderful letter back 
uh, describing how she as a Girl Scout growing up in Inglewood, California, would take trips out to the dunes to collect wildflowers. And she described the oceans of poppies and lupins uh, in this environment uh, back in that day. And also some of the, the things about Inglewood in the 1930s that weren't so savory that we look back with the shame on today. But you looked, uh, we, we put together a mosaic of all of the 1920s um, uh, aerial photographs. Uh, and so this is taking a series of photographs and putting them together. We've actually done this for the LALA project uh, for the entire basin and you can explore it and use it sort of as, uh, I call it the Google Earth time machine. You can go back and forth between the current uh, photographs and then these 1920s photographs. And then this is that area um, that I was talking about as the rail lines come into the Chevron refinery where there could still be something interesting out there. There could be a pool, there could be some fairy shrimp, there could be some indicator plants. We don't really know. Nobody's really, to my knowledge, botanized this little spot. It's right off Sepulveda. You can look at it, but you don't go in there. Of course, the Drona Marsh Preserve and the Gardena Willows are other relics of this previously historic, system, you know, extensive system of coastal prairie and seasonal wetland. Sometimes it would have been vernal pools and then vernal marshes, uh, et cetera, as you get uh, longer and longer hydro period going toward the south. Another one of these habitat types was the alkali meadows. This came out of a sort of our, my awareness of this came out of a project where we looked at the San Gabriel River historical uh, ecology in detail. And all these, um, uh, this green right here at the upper end of the coastal um, wetlands were alkali meadows and alkali meadows have a specific set of plants that are adapted to it flooding and drying and flooding and drying and leaving behind a lot of salt. So very salty soils. And so we find all of these plants that are associated with these alkali uh, soils and they has it right in the name there. Um, so you go down and you look in these areas in the older barium records and you discover, you know, Atriplex patula, um, Nitrophila occidentalis, Alkaline soils, alkaline flats, alkali sinks, subalkaline flats. And nobody really talks about these in the landscape today. And certainly nobody's out there going, hey, I need to restore some alkali flat. But we've lost alkali flats uh, enormously. They've now been almost entirely developed. Uh, but these plants do, in fact, hold on. Um, and so, I, and this is useful information to talk about potential. There is a park going in along the uh, a Biona Creek uh, up uh, up, upstream from the Biona wetlands. It was a MRCA park and they were uh, getting together the plant list. And I asked if I could talk to them uh, about what the habitat used to be, because it was an area that definitely used to be alkali meadow. And I told them, you know, you should be on the lookout for these plants. And lo and behold, they go out um, and confirm that they did have some remnant alkali adapted species there on the site. Now they couldn't just plant alkali species back because it's gonna be an active park and they needed shade and you know the soils weren't all native and you know there's a million reasons why you can't, but I think it's really useful to look, figure out this diversity and be on the lookout for those plants and also to maybe inspire uh, how you go about to try to manage those locations going into the future. And so things like this, uh, which is a map of the soils, uh, shows us uh, the basic geography of the, the sort of Los Angeles uh, lower uh, plain, the lower basin, and helps us understand a little bit about those alkali soils. Because these green, this areas here, they're sort of dark uh, green. Uh, show up. That's these are the alkali uh, meadow areas, and there's also a similar one right along here that heads uh, sort of on the inland side of something that you're going to notice in just a second, uh, which is the Newport Inglewood structural zone, aka the fault. So if there's if you think of a line that goes from Cheviot Hills, the Baldwin Hills, the Roche Branch Hills, the Mingus Hills, Sigel Hill, Reservoir Hill, all the way down to Bolsa Chica Mesa, that's all part of the same geological formation. And because it, it is raised up inside what is basically, I'll exaggerate, but it's basically a single river's floodplain. And I say single because 
the LA River and the San Gabriel River, you know, they exchange channels, one goes into another, that they're not two separate rivers. In the lower watershed, they're basically the same river. We've just separated them and said, you go here, you go there. Um, but it, it's it's really the same, the same system overall. And so when it when when water comes out, um, and in all the little watersheds around here, it has to get to the ocean through one of the what we call the gates between uh, the hills. And so between Dominguez Hills and Signal Hill is, is basically a gate, uh, one of those gates. There's a gate up here uh, when in the past, occasionally the water heads that direction and goes out Biona, north of Biona. But sometimes the water comes down and it runs into this, um, this hill. And that's what leads to that soil formation there. That's the, the, the sort of the water slows down and the fine sediments go down, come out and you get a particular fine sediment soil that then has seasonal water coming in and evaporating. And because rainwater has salts in it and it evaporates uh, over and over and over again, those waters get salty, uh, those, those, uh, those soils get salty. And even the inland part of the Biona system here, up here is, is alkaline as well. And it's not alkaline because there was tidal flow in there. It's alkaline because it had generations and generations of water ponding and then evaporating over top of it, leading to these unique plant communities. And so this is back to our Minecraft version. Now you'll notice this sort of North, uh, northwest to southeast feature that, that is the end of the dune system. And then on that side of it, we've got our alkali meadows. And there's also some other things in here. We've got wet meadows uh, and a couple other things, places where there are actual freshwater wetlands down here, this big sienega on the inland side of the, the, um, the Baldwin Hills. And, you know, we talk about these things and I can talk about them as if they're real, but we have basically paved these over entirely. Um, and so just to give a last example, this is the actual alkali soils map from the 19, early 1900s. Um, and so the different colors that you'll see on there, the yellows and the, um, I guess it's olive and the orange and whatnot are different alkali levels um, coming from this process. And that's gonna be where we had these unique plants uh, showing up, including, and this is interesting, including things like salt marsh uh, bird's bee, which is a you know, endangered species now. And you think of it as just being a salt marsh plant. It was all through these alkali meadows as well. Uh, so it's historical, it's historical habitat been reduced dramatically if we think of it just as, as a salt marsh plant. And it wasn't, it was much more broadly distributed than that. So that brings us to the Biona wetlands as a sort of a case study um, and of coastal wetlands and meadows. Uh, this is a project we finished in 2010 uh, with uh, many of the same characters uh, that I've been describing there for the current project. Uh, and this is actually the final map. Um, and the, the task here was to map the wetlands. So many of these projects have focused on wetlands and I'm gonna get some to some more uplands in a, in a little bit here. but. Um, there was this massive inland, uh, so just to orient everybody, the marina's right here, Biona Creek, uh, or actually the Biona flood control channel comes out here. Biona Creek never went to the ocean. Biona Creek came to the upper end of this big uh, marsh and basically petered out. There was no continuous flow to the ocean. Um, so the thing that you see and think of as Biona Creek is just a flood control conveyance. Um, and then you had, uh, it comes up, there's good creek along the north side of the Bion of the Baldwin Hills, and then there's massive inland wetland with freshwater marsh and peat peat bogs that that would catch on fire uh, when they were developing it or in the in the 1910s and whatnot. Just some incredible things going on uh, here in terms of you know plants that you would never think were there were actually there in terms of wetland habitats. And then all these dots up here are freshwater springs. So, and, and this of course completely defined, and there was the oak zone at the foothills here that sort of turns into the citrus zone eventually for interesting climatological reasons. Um, but uh, this was heavily occupied and managed by the, uh, the indigenous, the Quiche and the Chumash and the Tataviam Gabrielinos. 
Um, and then the springs here, obviously, as well, and, and, and whatnot. But Bayona makes this really interesting case because there's no record of cord grass um, in Bayona uh, from the late 1800s when people start collecting on through the early 1900s. And it only shows up after they jetty uh, the Bayona open. So, so it's like, what was this habitat? Well, this is the a pre-1887, um, 1888 coast survey map. Uh, and we've defined what these habitats were, but basically there was a double dune system on the coast with the, all the fascinating plants that go along with the dunes and the El Segundo dunes as well. You know, these oddball things from, from the desert like phalismas out there and some weird stuff. Um, and then this sort of swamp, and it was a swamp. Um, and it was dominated by freshwater. So Bayona Creek comes in and just peters out. And this is like, um, you know, quicksand. There's, there's, there's uh, accounts of, of uh, when they were trying to build the, the sanitary sewer from downtown Los Angeles out to the ocean, they had to decide which route to go. And they, they sent the surveyors out the Bayona route and they decided they couldn't send the sewer out Bayona because there was too much quicksand and they couldn't get the, the pipes to stay without breaking. That's how you Hyperion ended up at Hyperion. Fun fact. Um, and so we reconstruct this habitat um, and using all the tools in our toolbox, the old photographs and whatnot. And this is from Bayona when it was being used as, as a hunting ground. And one thing you'll notice there is that is not what a salt marsh looks like. Um, that's what a brackish or a freshwater marsh looks like. You know, those are tules, and um, that's not cord grass and pickleweed. And so you got the photographic evidence there. You go back, you've got the uh, uh, the bird records because before we could go around the, the city with devices and pretend like there's you know imaginary digital biodiversity that we can play games and, and find uh, people you know did it old school and they found birds and they found birds nests and they found plants and they did all these things so the birds nests and bird was a very popular thing in the late 1890s early 1900s and we find this nest record it's from a record at the uh the Western Foundation of Urban Zoology, talking about a song sparrow nest that was built with Thule from Bayona. It's like, okay, so we get these multiple sources going, well, this was probably a Thule marsh and not a, a salt marsh. And then you read the newspapers. And um, I won't read all this to you, but basically these are two late 1800s newspaper accounts describing Bayona as being a true lake that only breaks through to the ocean during the rainy season. And in this story here, a guy who had a uh, watering hole down in uh, uh, Playa del Rey, which is, was as much a thing in the uh, late 1800s as it is today, um, wanted to drain the lake because of uh, whatever reason and uh, got swept out in the ocean because the, the entire Bayona was filled with water. Uh, that once he started the water going, it eroded away the banks and swept them uh, out there. So it was a perched uh, freshwater wetland uh, during that time. And then when it opens up, then it turns into a salt marsh for part of the year. And then the, the longshore flow brings the sand along and turns it back into a closed wetland. And so the plants and the habitats and all this thing, you have to understand historically, were that of a closed wetland system. So looking at it, there it is the lake. This is from the Hall 1888 draft irrigation map um, showing Bayona as a lake. Here it took a little creative license and took the creek all the way, but we don't, this is about the only map that you'll find a distinct creek that goes all the way to the lake. Um, this is where they jetty it open to be a new pier. And that is the time, the, the first time in modern ecological history that the Biona is open to the ocean 24, uh, 365 days a year is when they build a pier and jetty the thing open. Um, and so the herbarium records are fascinating this way. You can find these freshwater and brackish habitat species, and then the jetty comes in and you see this transition uh, to the saltwater species. And it had these rare habitats like the alkali meadow, the salt pan, the alkali flats, um, and we probably have lost considerable plant diversity down there from those sort of brackish and wet meadow species. And we're going to lose even more if the state's view that this should be a, a fully tidal saltwater wetland 
uh, is actually implemented. Uh, because the state's plan for uh, management of this site is to dig it out, take it down even lower than it is today um, in the face of sea level rise and turn it into a completely tidal uh, system uh, that is in fact not the historical habitat type, nor is it the habitat type that we've lost the most of. As we move around the basin, we see places like the riparian forest. And this is just to give you a, uh, a, a dual thing about the power of the, of the river. This is the LA River in the, um, in the um, Elysian Valley, uh, which is in this uh, particular example, ripped down the, the bridge out to Glendale. And, uh, and there's billboards. Uh, so this is uh, early 1900s. And of course there's billboards. Today they're trying to shove more billboards down our throats, but of course they're digital today. Um, so the, this is our Minecraft version here, uh, our, our, and we're looking at this area here, which is north of downtown, uh, up into the Elysian Valley, and this riparian forest. And I did a project on this for the, um, oh, I forgot to list them as collaborators, with Land IQ, and uh, we did it for the, uh, the Nature Conservancy, looking at the planning of that area. And sometimes you come across resources that you can't even believe when you're trying to understand the history. This is, this is a map, obviously, by uh, two folks named Compton and Dockweiler. Now, to you and I in contemporary Los Angeles, Compton and Dockweiler are a town and a beach, uh, but Compton and Dockweiler were, were actually engineers and surveyors. And they did this extraordinarily detailed topographic map of the Elysian Valley north of downtown. One of the reasons they did this back in the, in the late 1800s was there was a never ending set of um, uh, proposals to dam the Elysian Valley and turn it into a reservoir to solve the water problem for Los Angeles. Um, now, of course, we did that by going and stealing water from an entire different part of the state. That's a whole other story. But over time, so they wanted to know the topography and what was going on in the Elysian Valley pretty darn well. Um, and the detail is just extraordinary. You find these like the little islets in the in the middle of the of the L.A. River on its course in 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 the late 1800s. And this was marshy and that was blackberries and this was a garden. It was it's really quite remarkable to think about that detail. And so what I did is I took that map and got it all digitized. Um, and it actually extends up into the San Fernando Valley as well. And then digitized every single LA River Channel I could find on a map uh, from the 1800s on to present. Uh, and so you can see how it's changed. Uh, the historical bends uh, in it are, 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 are erased until eventually you get to, even by the late 1800s, it's straightened out considerably. But we go back in this early one, you had the original um, the original channel with all sorts of oxbows and meanders. You had low marshes in there. You had then an active floodplain that was probably, you know, your cottonwoods and things like that. And then another terrace full of oaks. Um, and, and, the, and the photographic record of thinking like, what was this like? This area that we're now thinking so much about restoration or at least ecological management. Uh, we go back and look at these historic photographs it tended to dry out pretty considerably in the winter time. That's a whole debate. There's some folks working about how dry was it? Was there enough base flow uh, for there to be perennial water? I tend to think during dry years, there were certain areas that it dried out completely. Um, did we, did we, you know, raise up the levees or did we incise the levees in for the current channel? And this picture really answers that question. We filled it in. <laughs> you know, the, we see here the old floodplain channel with all those old sycamores and oaks and stuff down here. And then we have built out and are going in. And this area right in the middle, that's eventually going to turn into the thing that we call the LA River. And I always like to tell the landscape architecture students that I work with that, you know, don't think of the LA River today as the whole river. That's just where we decided to put the channel. That's the flood control channel. That's the left. The river inhabited all that space 
and did its thing across all that area. If you really want to understand what it was as a river, you've got to think of it not as the skeleton that we left it with, but the floodplain that it was back in the past. So, you know, looking at this, and this is comparing a contemporary view to the, you know, the early, um, you know, the 20s and maybe early 30s here, all this floodplain down there, we've taken and just shoved it into the, the river itself. But so now we know, and we can think about these things as we try to start uh, being inspired about what to do with these landscapes um, and, and think about what are the habitats that we lost and where might we go to find things. And so to, just to give you an example, this map right here I shared, it was probably a couple of years ago um, in a talk. And there's some stuff up here that maps uh, river wash in sort of the Northeast San Fernando Valley. And so river wash would be these areas that were the, the, um, the, the seasonal uh, drainage from the, the San Gabriel Mountains that would go across the San Fernando Valley um, and, and then dry out in the summertime. And so uh, an enterprising young botanist, Richard Rackman, uh, went out to a, a park uh, that had really not been botanized too much, but it had some weedy areas around the edge. And he went and found a pretty, you know, for the basin, you can see here at the time, first modern day record for the basin um, of uh, Stalingia linearifolia. And so at, by specifically taking that map of the historical uh, habitats and thinking and cross-referencing it with parks and open space and going, hey, I'd, I'd like to go look there. Um, and that brings me back to something that Rudy always used to tell me, which was, uh, you know, we know more about the, the, the face of the moon than we know about the biodiversity of the El Segundo Dunes. And he wasn't wrong. You know, there's just, there's still so much out there um, that hasn't been looked at, that hasn't been measured. And of course, he was an insect person, so we've got tons of insects to deal with. But there's the fungal diversity, the plant diversity that, you know, people haven't surveyed in modern day. And so that's sort of the archival work. Most of that is inspired by that I've just shown you. We go into the archives, we look at the old maps, we look at the old photographs, we come up with this concept. But there's also a, a sort of more quantitative approach to this that one can take. And so this is where the oaks and walnuts grow, which goes back to our conversation before the talk started tonight about, you know, were there oaks on the Palisades Peninsula? Um, so I'll walk you through how we go about uh, doing this. Of course, oaks and walnuts have been important for thousands of years in the LA Basin, and there are entire, basically, you know, familial dynasties in the indigenous community that grew up around particular oak trees. Oak trees were heavily managed. Uh, for production, they were staple crops, uh, you know, it supported a complex society, walnuts, similarly important uh, species. And so to highlight on this map here where we think, you know, at the rough level from the historical, you know, first pass was these were areas that are probably oak and woodlands. So sort of the north face of the Santa Monica Mountains, maybe the, also the, uh, the, the south face at the foothills, the East LA Hills out to Puente Hills and whatnot, down through uh, Elysian Park and whatnot. So these, you know, these are this is a rough estimate because these are like, were they dominant in a square kilometer? Um, but in some ways, that's sort of not completely satisfying. And there is a data set that we could use to try to figure this out. There are these maps of the entire state of California that were done by a guy named Wieslander in the 1930s for purposes of measuring timber and, and rangeland and all this sort of thing. And um, the bright pink uh, magenta colors here are the uh, oak and walnut woodlands. And then there's this missing thing here, and that's because Wieslander um, looked at that in the 1930s and went, yeah, that's the city, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so he did everything else. Uh, but didn't do uh, didn't do the Griffith Park in downtown in the, in the eastern Santa Monica Mountains. So how we approach this then is because I want to know with some better, you know, more confidence perhaps where these species were, where were the walnuts, where were the oaks, where were the sambucus, um, these you know really important species on the landscape for biodiversity. And so what we do is we get all sorts of geospatial data the aspect, the slope, the elevation, the northeastness, which is a measure of how wet it is, 
Um, there's a thing called topographic roughness, which is what it basically sounds like, how, how cragged is, uh, is the landscape. Topographic wetness, which is about measuring how much water is accumulating across it. A little bit about the soils, so water storage and root zone depth and all this stuff. Maximum temperature, minimum temperature, precipitation differences. We basically then take all these data and then a bunch of location data for these different species and use machine learning, you know, artificial intelligence to figure out how do these variables explain those distributions. So you take a bunch of locations, a bunch of environmental variables, and you say, hey, uh, chat GPT, except it isn't chat GPT, um, how do these things relate to each other? And so it ingests all this information, all these location points. So this is our um, Dumosa locations, Quercus Dumosa. And I apologize if I haven't lumped or splitted my oaks properly and the shrub oaks because I tend not to pay as much attention to that as I should. So that then turns up Dumosa brevaria photica. And it gives us these maps of the probability of encountering different species in different locations across that landscape. There's some flaws to this pretty considerably that you can see right of way. One, we've got some empty spots. That's where we're missing some soils data. We've redone these and gotten the soils data added. Uh, you also see that freeways show up. That's obviously a problem because the topographic information that we have is the modern topography, which includes everything we've done to shave off the tops of mountains and build freeways. And I'll just give you as a teaser, as part of the current project that we're working on, We've actually, Cal State Long Beach has done this, taken the old topographic maps from the 1930s and extracted those topo lines and created a 1930s topographic map of the LA Basin, which is really quite incredible. I'll show you how it works in a minute if we have time to get to it. Um, so there's our, there's our scrub oaks. There's valley oak. Shows us in the valley, sort of extends into the San Fernando Valley a little bit. I know where that spot is right there. That's like Encino, north of Ventura. There's a neighborhood in there that has, to my mind, the, 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 the easternmost uh, uh, valley oak. So if we crisp this up and just looked at the reds and the oranges, and the, that's going to be the core of that habitat. We did Engelman oak, too. And we, so we're hitting that, uh, you know, sort of bimodal Engelman oak distribution. It suggests maybe some suitability other places, but really hits the, the core of those distributions quite nicely, the Mesa Oak. Um, there's our Coast Live Oak map. And um, A, we're doing another one and it's better than this. Uh, but B, there's some interesting things. Um, one is this question right here. So, Basically, what this map is telling us is that you, you're getting up to the, the 60, high 60s, maybe 70 percentile of similarity between the topography, temperature, soils, et cetera, of the Palos Verdes Peninsula and the places where we validated and there's, you know, oaks are crazy, right? So we've got places that we know are super high density oaks and the similarity is there that maybe, you know, um, but I'm not, like I said, you have to be able to live with uh, uncertainty in this and, and just recognize that maybe someday we'll come across some documentary evidence that's like 100% there were oaks uh, on the on the, on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The uh, elderberry, the elderberries are there. They show up nicely on the, on the, um, on the map here. Uh, and we did this as well because of the, the cultural importance of these species, because all this choice of species was done with the tribes uh, that we were that are, are the co-investigators on this project. Um, and they were very interested in the oaks, the walnuts, the elderberries. Um, so here's our um, California walnut map and uh, kind of hits the, the right places. Uh, Puente Hills, the eastern Santa Monica Mountains here, but also out uh, a little bit to the north. Uh, and we pick up some higher ranking habitats in the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And I know that you have them there and they're growing and happily because I've taken pictures of them. Um, so that tells us, at least for this map, uh, there's a good chance of you encountering it, even with some of these 50% values and up. Um, so this is how we go about uh, that and comparing it to a thesis that, no, 
This is the 1972 um, Trees of California book by the Forest Service. That was the map that they had um, for uh, Trees of California, uh, Griffith, uh, Griffin. And we didn't model all the way, but you can see how our model is not too bad. Maybe we need a few more training points up here to, to fill it in a little bit more. Uh, this is a thesis from 1967 from Cal State LA uh, for California Walnut. He didn't get them all. He didn't know they were down on the peninsula and didn't drive his 1962 fair lane or whatever it was out to visit them. Um, but he certainly documented them in that range. And you can go out today. One of the fascinating things about this map I'll just show you is that there is habitat that is predicted across the San Fernando Valley. Um, and as we zoom in, there are some areas that are higher than others. And we can go to this uh, here. This is sort of like uh, Northridge. And these are old growth California walnuts. Now, two options. Either they were planted, could be, I don't know, can't prove it. Or like the model says, there was good habitat for them on some of these alluvial fans that went across these alluvial soils that went across the San Fernando Valley that were good enough to uh, support them. So I'll take the last one here to go to the Channel Islands um, and talk a little bit about back casting there, just to give you a, a sense of, I showed you some plants. Uh, we did that for entire communities on the, on the, the, the Channel Islands. So we did, um, this is obviously uh, Catalina, uh, Catalina Elevation, Catalina Aspect, uh, Northeastness, Topographic Wetness, a few things. Uh, there's the Topographic Wetness, which you can see follows the ridge lines are dry, the canyon bottoms are wet, right? So this is modeling the entire thing. And we took all of the vegetation types from mapped in basically late 90s uh, and created predictive maps of where they should be found across the across uh, Catalina and then overlaid them into this. And so there was a, a, so this is like our potential natural vegetation map. If you remember, we started with Kukler's map of California, potential natural vegetation. And he maps like, like four polygons on Catalina. It's like, ah, there's oaks there, there's scrub there, there's chaparral there. Um, and we created this that kind of said, no, it's probably a lot more detailed than that. And, but it has some of the same patterns uh, as the historic map. There's the Kukler map in the same colors now. Uh, on this side, they're in the same colors. Uh, so this is the vegetation map that was there that we trained from. And then we mapped a much greater extent for the oaks than is existing present today. Uh, and hopefully, and actually I know it will, will help guide some of the restoration work out there because currently Land IQ uh, the consulting firm and I at UCLA, uh, we're starting on a, a, some work out there to talk to the conservancy and, and, and share a bit about these maps and, and how, they, how they worked. Um, we did a similar project out on uh, San Clemente Island, which if you're not familiar with it, is the one that the Navy likes to bomb. And so from about there southward, you really have to go with the guide. I haven't been out there yet myself, but I've been collaborating with people working on island. But the thing that we did there is we created a historic topographic map. This is a reconstruction. Uh, this map is not the current topography. This is a reconstruction of the, of the a digital reconstruction of what they mapped in the, um, in the 1800s, 1880s, 80, 80, whatever, I forget the exact date, um, that we, we digitized all those lines there's a bunch of lines here on that map. We digitized every one of them, created this map, um, looked at how it worked relative to the current topography. So the old map was pretty good, but not perfect. Some things were obviously wrong based on where things are today. They couldn't have moved. Other things were perfectly where they should have been. Like this, this little drainage is exactly historically where it would have been. But in today's world, it's been eroded and, and head cut because of all the grazing. And, the, and we calculated the, the total tonnage of soil that was lost during the grazing era and whatnot. Put together a bunch of layers like the, the, uh, the soils and the, uh, the fog, low clouds and fog, which is what this is. Did the same thing that I told you before about machine learning and created a model of the 1879 vegetation versus the 2017 vegetation. 
um, which is just a really fun exercise to build hypotheses because we've got some unanswered questions out there, like, is it got grazed intensively for like a hundred plus years? Um, and that resulted in a lot of the plants just being along the steep northern coast um, and missing from these areas that got the uh, good word tar grazed out of them. Um, and so this is a, a, a reconstruction then based on the historical topography uh, that extrapolates backwards uh, from what the, the current topography is. And so you can start asking really interesting questions like this Malva Rosa, which is Malva Asurgenta folia or something along those lines. It's the San Clemente tree mallow, um, which was described in 1873 as being unbroken forest extending for miles on high plateaus or by uh, the Malva Roses were on the South coast that were eaten in cattle, but he recalls groves of them. But eventually, by the time people are looking at the island botanically uh, in earnest in the modern era, Malva is like it had escaped to the cliffs because it was the only place that the grazers couldn't get. And so it raised this question, like, where was this plant? And by mapping the historical topography, we mapped out that uh, Backers Pygolaris would have been this massive open area at the top. But that's only because there's backers there now that we were kind of queuing in on in these, these models. Backers by Laris is a really important early succession, you know, chaparral scrub species. Um, and if we look at the cessation of grazing in the Santa Monica Mountains, often you find backers comes in, turns into a backers grove, and then it turns into a more diverse coastal sage scrub habitat. And so I'm hypothesizing that this area that has been so degraded and is now getting reinvaded, and that we're modeling as Bacchus is probably those high plateaus that the botanists were talking about in the late 18 in the 1870s, uh, and that this bush mallow was out there. The other descriptions out there are just incredible. Like they talk about there just being carpets and carpets of Dudleyas, like you couldn't walk without walking on Dudleyas. And if you go back country in, in Catalina a little bit, you'll see this as well. Uh, this just like you know we think of Dudleys as these like rare plants and they're so precious. And then you go and it's like, there's literally like square meter, tens of square meters of just like solid, solid Dudleys. So those are some of the approaches that we use. It's some of the inspiration that we get. And the, the little secret here is, as I said, I'm not trained as a botanist. I am no good in the field. I only know the plants that people have taught me. I've spent a heck of a lot of time in herbaria. I've spent a heck of a lot of time looking at herbarium specimens and thinking about these, these patterns and trying to describe them. And I wanna empower everybody to just go out and look at the landscape with new eyes maybe, and maybe find some place that's a, you know, called a waste place in today in, in the historic language uh, that, that maybe hasn't been completely demolished in terms of its seed bank um, or has been ignored, uh, underappreciated. Or if you're in the design fields or the gardening fields to, to look at these things as inspiration uh, of, of some of the types of habitats that we've lost the most and that we might enrich our lives by folding them back in uh, to the landscape that we live on today. So that's my email. It should say .edu, but it's 11.30 at night here, so sorry about that. I will take your questions. Well, Travis, that was amazing. There's a couple comments in the in chat. One from uh, from Heather White, who uh, who tells everyone that her dad lived on Shirley Avenue, which is one of your photos in Tarzana. And her dad relates that some of the walnut yeah. trees were definitely planted. Um, not not disallowing that there could have been some there historically as well. And then, yeah, well, absolutely. I, I I share these things as um, and sometimes they're provocations, and you some we will never know, and it's fun to think about, and some we may narrow down and go, you know what, those probably were mostly done historic Santa Cruz vegetation. Yeah, that that we didn't map it, but but we have 
we have projected it, and there's a paper on it. This is Allo's question about historic Santa Cruz vegetation. There is a paper on that that you can find. Um, and, my, and for Tracy, my email, longcore, L-O-N-G-C-O-R-E, at U-C-L-A dot E-D-U. I'll just go on the, I got, I can see the chat here. So let me just take these as they come in. Uh, Max, can we positively identify tree species from historical era images such as UCSB, frame finder? Okay, so what we've done at this point, sometimes you can really tell oaks, right, from, from those. Um, we have created a digital mosaic of the all of those for the entire basin, and we'll set you all loose on looking at your favorite spots with them when we release this most recent project. It's a Haynes project um, and the Haynes Foundation project, and we should be releasing it in a few months. Lolly. Oh, wonderful talk, uh, Travis. Really fascinating. Uh, I actually have a question about your uh, machine learning models. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what uh, architecture uh, you and your collaborators used? Uh, like, was it a convolutional neural net? I'm just, uh, I, I no, can't no. It, it's, yeah. it's simple, it's simple stuff. It's maximum entropy. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's maximum entropy modeling. We've explored a little bit with random forest, um, but given that it's mostly um, presence only data, and maximum entropy is designed for that. Um, that's what we've used. I know I I get reviewers occasionally who are like, "That's so old school." You know, you you, you have to do multiple models and average them and whatnot. And I'm not as conf I'm not so confident in all of our data that I think I need to worry too much more about it. These are these are we're going to be interpreting them and not trying to do engineering with them. So I'm pretty happy with where we are. Absolutely, yeah, I agree about that. That the input is just so uncertain that it doesn't matter, yeah. you know, sophisticated model you use at a certain point. Yeah. Um, okay, are these maps available? Matt asks. Uh, if you go to lalandscapehistory.org, some of them are broken at the moment, um, and I need to fix them. Uh, but they, the intent of the current project and the previous project is to make all of this stuff available. Um, and so, like, for example, that one kilometer uh, thing has, we've already shared and, and you can add it to your map wherever you might be mapping. So LALandscapeHistory.org for that. Uh, trees, is it available? Have you looked at or know anyone who work on historic marine vegetation? Chloe, um, thank you for that question. Um, I know people, and this is where being a certain age is a detriment. I am not coming up with names at the moment, but who are trying to reconstruct using aerial, old aerial photographs and maps, uh, kelp distributions along the coast of California. So there are, is, I hope that's what you meant by marine vegetation. Um, There's a question what do we, to repeat your uh, email address. I think it went by too quickly. Yeah, quickly yeah it's Longcore, L-O-N-G-C-O-R-E, my last name, at U-C-L-A dot E-D-U. Or you can Google my name in pretty much any email you find at Urban Wildlands or LA Audubon or <laughs> whatnot will, will work. Um, yes, Angel, thank you for getting that link there. Yeah, you can look at all the historic uh, topos online. They're all up. You can, uh, uh, like I said, we'll have the, eventually you're gonna have the, the photographs done. Uh, yes, forestry, the Griffin, the Griffin text. Thank you, whoever, whoever grabbed that. That was a nice little find. Um, oh, there was an earlier question about historic Santa Cruz Island vegetation, but maybe that preceded your discussion about it. Right. Um, yeah, so th that map uh, that we did is, is uh, uh, 
we'll call it potential natural vegetation because uh, and 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 stands in a little bit for historic and needs to be modified you know continue to be refined as more information comes to light we'll put it that way uh, ah yes jim ah yes the beef bluff restoration project yes one of my favorites it's that looking north from the parking lot at uh, in torrance and going there's a lot of ice plant there i bet there could be butterflies and um, yeah, then Andalki and I made it happen. Yeah, and, uh, thank you for your efforts. It's um, it's wonderful to see the El Segundo Blue uh, making a comeback. Well, I'll tell you the embarrassing story about that, which is when we were rich, Urban Wildlands Group, which is a nonprofit that I work with, um, we got contacted to restore the little seven tenths of an acre right at the uh, snack shack at the southern end of the um, the uh, bike path. And at that time, they, um, the El Segundo Blue was about a thousand feet away um, on private property uh, south, 1200 maybe. And People are like, do they need a permit? You know, do they want to do what's called a safe harbor so that they can, if they make habitat for an endangered species, can they take it away later and whatnot? And I'm like, you know, everything I've read, <laughs> danger of reading too much, um, is that they're very sedentary. There's not a very good chance that they're going to come. And if we want to, if we want the butterflies, we're probably going to have to uh, bring them. And so, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it. So we do the restoration and plants start growing. And it only took like three years for El Zagunu Blue Butterfly to decide that no, they don't actually stay around their plants. They don't actually stay in their patches. Some of them go walk about and found the, the plants on the beach bluffs and they showed up. Now, I can't rule out that some Johnny apple seed butterfly lover did it. Uh, it wasn't me or anybody I know, I'll tell you that. Um, and I had to eat crow because they're like, what's this? You said that it, uh, you know, it was very sedentary and liked to stay around its food plant. I said, well, sorry, <laughs> but now you can open your door and uh, in Torrance and Redondo Beach. And, you know, we got money and did the, the, another four acres and you guys are continuing that on. Um, and you know, thousands and thousands of people can see an endangered species right there. So that's, um, I'll take the embarrassment for that to be the outcome. Agreed. Yeah, it's wonderful to, um, to see the community come together around the restoration. We've got a four year, $80,000 grant now with US Fish and Wildlife to restore seven acres um, all the way up to Avenue C eventually. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, uh, Wally's asking for the, the name once again of the of the early Los Angeles vegetation book. Yeah, it's it's, it's Leroy it's Leroy Abrams, and I think it's just called Flora of Los Angeles, and there may be more Flora of Los Angeles. But just look for just look for Leroy Abrams, and I think most of these are now available through like um, the Biodiversity Library or something like that, where you can get a whole PDF of them. Yeah, I found it online. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a there's a number of of those early floras that are kind of interesting. Oh, there's a question here from Isabel. She's asking about uh, Quercus uh, tomentella on the mainland. She says, "What do we know about it and other plant communities from when the islands were part of the mainland?" It yeah, I saw a map, and I think you identified that in one of your maps. Is the maybe that was the first. Yeah, I did this. I didn't do Tomantella. Um, and so I'm going to defer to somebody else to talk about how Tomantella does on the mainland. I'm only just becoming familiar with it by going out to Catalina recently and looking at a bunch of them. Um, I will say, you know, vegetation communities that were part of the, you know, the, the mainland Channel Island thing. You know, Palos Verdes, of course, is so essentially important to that whole thing and the presence of Crossosoma. Um, and, 
which is a uh, y'all probably know the story better than me, but right, it's 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 a species. There's one species in the genus, and the genus is in a, in a family, and it's like the only species in the family. It's like a completely unique plant um, that's that's out on uh, uh, out on the Channel Islands and on historically on the ocean side of the Valserres Peninsula. I happen to know though that there is an extra one uh, at the fuel depot in on the north side of the because we put that in there years ago as part of a little a little uh, just a bank against uh, extinction, you know, to, to see if it would grow there. But um, does somebody want to handle the Tome and Tele question? Because I can't. It says great in gardens on the peninsula. It's a beautiful tree, hard to find though. I think Tree of Life grows some, but it, it's not readily available. And I don't know why. All right. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else want to add about anything about Tomentella? And Orchid confirms that it's it's great in cultivation. Fine, she says. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that um, UC Davis is recommending it as one of their potential climate resilient plants um, for Southern California. I think on the basis that it uh, it thrives on a little less water than than ours. So I wanted to ask if you're available it, because uh, LA County Public Works is planning to do restoration work along the Dominguez watershed. And so if some of their engineers contact you, May, and there may be funding available to uh, create similar maps specific to the Dominguez watershed. Well, that'd be super exciting. We've got a lot of baseline uh, research for Dominguez watershed and uh, already digitized uh, maps uh, that uh, might be might be helpful. So yeah, happy to be put in touch and I may loop in uh, appropriate experts to help. All right, it looks like uh, George uh, Zhang is putting out a lot of links here. And I, I haven't followed them all. Maybe George, you wanna kind of summarize what you're telling us? Uh, yes, so uh, the link I just put on is the collaboration between uh, UCANR and USFS about 12 trace species for Southern California and focus from, uh, from Mendoza with one of them. So you will see the initial result. So pretty much uh, a two research paths, one in them and one on the coast. Uh, researchers planted uh, 12 trace species and then we water and good and after two years we cut irrigation so you will see all the results in the report however follow up with the researchers before you think that's all i can say okay your, your audio is a little garbled it looks it looks like you've got um kind of present day uh predictive vegetation mapping for um what is called what are called climate ready trees and a lot of them turn out to be uh, uh, native trees it looks like so is that a fair summary yes okay thanks so al to answer your question about um whether i presented any of the politically uh, challenging information to the state about biona the answer is, uh, I did as soon as we discovered it um, and was in a meeting with um, the person who was basically heading the deal at that time, wasn't actually the state uh, fish and wildlife, it was the Bay Foundation and um, was basically told, we've already decided that we're going to do something else and you need to get on board or and not confuse the public. 
And so I've spent the, whatever it's been, 13 years since um, sharing uh, this information as much and as broadly as I can <laughs> and writing detailed comments that have been the basis for uh, legal challenges to the state's concept, which, I mean, it gives me no pleasure to oppose them, but it's just not, um, it's not a, uh, uh, a clever way to go about the challenges that are faced there at this point in time. And is in fact damaging. So, yep. Beavers, Max, okay, beavers. So I wrote a paper about beavers once. Um, wrote a paper about beavers at Lake Skinner in San Diego County and sort of made the point that uh, all the plants that, that they were eating on that people were upset about had actually co-evolved with beavers and that beavers were native to the Colorado River across the desert right near it and were probably native pretty far south, if not to San Diego County, a ways. And, and then there's somebody who wrote a paper some other folks that re really sort of said with earnestness that they were in whatever we're going to call Southern California. And then the folks from uh, USGS down in San Diego got upset and they, they wrote a paper like, oh, you people all just anecdotal, blah, blah, blah. And they definitely weren't in Southern California. I think part of the challenge with that conversation um, is the definition of what Southern California is. Because I had a nice long talk with one of the, the USGS guys. Um, I'm like, when you said they definitely weren't in Southern California, did you mean they weren't in uh, Ventura or, or Santa Barbara County? Because you look at, and, and I work with the um, Lala project with uh, some folks who are experts in the Chumash languages. And there's beaver place names all over the place in Santa Barbara County. Um, and and, and the, my colleague, who's Jumash, is just like, basically, are you kidding? Of course there were beavers in Santa Barbara County. You know, they're in all our stories. Why would, why would you think that there wouldn't be beavers in, San, in Santa Barbara County? Um, and it turns out when I talked to the USGS guy, he's like, uh, you know, we were really thinking more about San Diego. I'm like, ah, <laughs> so people from San Diego think that that uh, when they say it's not in Southern California, they don't necessarily mean um, Santa Barbara County. Uh, that's like north to them. Um, and so I think there, if we all got the people who are debating this in a room, we might be able to get to some agreement over which area they were likely to have been in. I probably, were you saying Cajon Pass? Again, I don't know, um, but unless, I have much less problem with beavers given that than I would with like uh, dingoes, right? Because everything evolved with beavers and you, you only have to go back 10,000 years and they were definitely here. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's our best use of resources unless there's specific reasons that you don't want the landscape changes that come along with beavers to happen, right? Because they're engineers. And they're gonna they're gonna dam things up, and they're gonna slow water down. And they're gonna make more riparian habitat. And they're gonna make more ponds, and they're gonna do all this stuff. And unless that's unless that's gonna be really bad for some specific biodiversity conservation reason, and the, the USGS guys have a reason for that, which is arroyo toads just don't do well when they're down to their last habitat, and then a beaver, you know, does in their last habitat, right? So I get the need to manage in that in that scenario, um, but some of these areas along the edges, I think we might want to just let beavers be beavers. All 
All right, team. There's still 56 of you here. More questions. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's more questions too. <laughs> there were a lot of good questions. So, all right. Well, there was a, there were a lot of complimentary uh, uh, comments in the uh, in the chat. So, thank you, Travis. That was really great. Well, thank um, you, and I I honestly thank you all the the friends I've I've pulled weeds with and talked to and over the years that I see here tonight, and uh, really appreciate you coming. Travis, you were talking about another map you might show if there was time, or did you? I think we got through them all. Okay. Or did we? Yeah. Yeah, I got through them all. All right. Well, we super appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, to all of you that showed up tonight, thank you for giving these important topics your attention. I think we're all richer for it. So, uh, so with that, I'll uh, end the recording and say good night.